Excellent. Okay, so I was asked by Sue um, uh, McDonald, um, um, who I've known for quite a number of years. We <laughs> seem to meet each other <laughs> at um, at conferences and so forth. So, um, and it's one of these things that I I do have an interest in. Um, so I'm just going to just have one of my. That's better. Um, yeah, it's. Um, it's one of, one of the subjects I do have quite an interest in and um, for obvious reasons as well. So let's just keep on going because obviously time is limited. Um, okay, um, so the Embrace report comes out every three years. And to be quite honest, I've been slightly confused because there was one in 2019 and key recommendations and another one's come out again 2020. Mm. But I think it's just to really keep us all updated as to what is going on. Um, and the maternity mortality rate, maternal mortality rate is actually used as a measure of the quality of the, of the healthcare system. Um, and so you could actually say that the UK healthcare system is very good. Um, however, um, you know, one of the things that we have noticed within the UK maternity services is that women who are of African or of African origin um, and their babies have increased risk of poor experiences and outcomes. Um, so despite that, this um, unique system and um, is known all over the world, it's is quite unique um, for its regular collection of um, information, statistics surrounding childbirth and outcomes. It continues to have these long-standing issues of disproportionate levels of poor outcomes for women from African and um, African Caribbean origin. Now, I am going to be talking about, obviously, um, black and brown women. So we're talking about black women, Asian women, and women from minority ethnic groups. But I, I will be sort of focusing on the women who are um, black African, black Caribbean as well, mainly, because um, this is really where, for me, there is a concern. Um, so what we do know is that the inequalities do remain. And as you can see um, from this infograph from Embrace, um, we've got on the top line here the number of um, the rate um, of maternal mortalities per 100,000, uh, sorry, uh, maternities up at the top here, sorry, of black women. And um, in comparison to white women down here, Okay, um, we've got Asian women just here. Okay, and I think um, from the information that we have been given, um, Asian women are two times more likely to suffer um, to suffer um, mortality, morbidity in pregnancy and childbirth and um, black women are five times more likely. This figure's actually gone down to um, four times more likely. Now, I'm not too sure when that happened, um, and, but it has gone down. Um, now, as what is really good here in this particular, um, in this particular um, slide is that they've really tried to just separate the women out. It doesn't say um, Bane. Um, and I think this is really important that we continue to do this, right, where we are extrapolating the women out and making sure we are representing each one of the ethnicities separately so we know exactly what's going on in the ethnicities, in the different ethnicities. Um, and along here, it just tells us what women have died of. Um, and what we do know this year, um, what we do know is that the, the main reason for uh, maternal mortality is... Um, thrombo um, sorry um blood clots i should say mm. okay um and this is another infogram i'm just quickly going to go through this and again um it sh it's it's showing us um what women are dying of and the numbers of women so in 2016 to 2018 217 women died um, and that's a report from 2020 but what's also interesting and i, I um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide, um, is that they've actually 
noted that um, it's almost like a joined up reason as to why women are dying. You know, they're not dying of one particular thing or one particular reason, you know, the woman could be a smoker. She might be known to social services, uh, might live in deprived conditions, um, might be um, someone who's not a UK citizen, may have been born for, born outside the UK, doesn't speak English. And all these things have contributed to why this woman has died. Um, what we don't have is more information, but we can talk about that later. Um, now, I preferred this slide, I'm sorry, um, which came out in 2019. And I think this clearly shows the disparity in that if you look at the number of um, deliveries or the percentage of deliveries of black women here, um, and it's 4% in comparison to white women, which is 80%. But then you look at the um, the maternal mortality rate, and it's 38, point, uh, 38 per 100,000. Um, and for white women, it's seven per 100,000. If you go to Asian women, it's 13 per 100,000. Um, Asian women represent 10% of the population who are delivering. So again, you can see the major disparity there. And this is another slide, and this is coming from 2019. And again, it showed us that um, black women are five times more, Asian women are two times more likely to, to die in pregnancy and childbirth. So just some points of practice. Um, and I'll just move on. <laughs> now, what I've noticed in practice and while I was in higher education as well, uh, working in higher education is that always key messages coming from the reports. 2014, there was a major drive on sepsis. Women were um, offered the flu vaccine, um, major drive on seps um, sepsis. Um, then moving on from that, uh, mental health matters. Again, a major drive on that, okay? Um, moving on from that, we've got here that we need to make sure that we are observing these women six weeks after childbirth, because um, that's when a lot of women have died. Um, and just looking at their health problems and other, other vulnerabilities. Um, there is mention here of black, age, black and Asian women about um, their, um, sorry, that they are at high risk of dying in pregnancy. So there is mention there, no recommendations. So, I mean, you know, why? why? Why has this happened then? Why are we constantly being informed that there is a problem within the maternity services for black, Asian and minority ethnic women that they are more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth? Um, we got this information, we get it every three years. Um, however, no recommendations. Um, no targets being set. So um, how are we going to remove these racial disparities in, in our midwifery practice? What has been the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room has been racism. Now, it's very difficult for all of us to talk about racism in the maternity services, but we need to talk about it. We are going to have to start asking questions as to why these inequities continue while those in authority have apparently remained unconcerned or unmoved um, at this high rate of mortality and morbidity of these women. Um, I want to really go on to say, would it be true to say that the legacy of slavery continues to haunt these women when they use the maternity services, which is entrenched in structural racism in society? I think these are the questions that we really need to be asking. I mean, all the stuff we've heard about structural racism, is it affecting our maternity services to the point where our women are actually not having good outcomes? Do we actually, when we're booking women, do we inform them that they're more likely to have a poorer outcome than their white counterparts? I'm sure that we don't do that. Um, however, if we're not doing that, and we, I mean, who would do that? What are we doing about it in practice? 
And we all need to be asking ourselves these questions. Now, after the death of George Floyd um, last year in May, and, um, and with the ongoing pandemic, um, many of us midwives from black and minority ethnic backgrounds um, have, checked, have checked ourselves, you know, and that, that goes along with our white counterparts as well, our white colleagues. We've all thought, hold on a minute, what is going on here? And there has been a realization that there is racism entrenched within our maternity services. It might be covert, but it's there. And it is affecting the women that we're looking after. And this legacy, it impacts from birth to grave. And um, it just enforces that there's no equality in society that we live in and we socially, contrib socially and economically contribute to. Now, the system itself um, represents us with, gives us policies and institutionalized practices that, again, are linked to the history of white privilege. And when I say white privilege, these are like almost like unconscious, what we call unconscious bias, where people aren't in the realization that their policies that are in place are not fit for purpose for the, for the population that's, that's been served. Um, and we need to ask these questions. Why has inequ and these inequities um, thrived in maternity? Um, and also, why is there only mention every three years with the China reports with no recommendations or targets given? Now, I remember watching the, um, the Health and Select Committee, and I think it was um, one of the Labour, senior La Labour MPs, um, she asked the question, are there any targets? She heard the information about five times more, but she said, what are our targets? Are there any targets we made? And she was told no. And I could see the light, I'm sorry, on her face. She was like completely taken aback. No targets, no recommendations, no targets. I'm just going on to Stephen Lawrence. And again, this is just saying that um, about institutional uh, racism within um, the National Health Service. And um, there's a legal obligation for public sector organizations to promote race equality within them. Can we honestly say that is happening? You know, it remains an issue. It does remain an issue. Institutionalized racism does remain an issue. So unfortunately, um, this kind of um, institutionalized racism does not only exist within the NHS, but it also exists within the people that we partnership partner with. And that's like in higher education. And um, you'll find that black and minority ethnic staff, they find themselves in disciplinary sanctions much at a much higher rate. Um, there's a, let's keep it swept under the carpet and let's not um, just drop the allegations and we'll just let you go, that kind of attitude. So it's not resolved. Um, and also there is um, unfortunately widening gaps of attainment for students from black and minority ethnic groups. I just really want to quickly talk about cultural competency, which is very important. If we're, use, if we're, if we're culturally competent in our practice, um, it is good clinical practice. And it enables, it, it enables that woman, it empowers that woman to um, be involved in the decisions made around her care. And you will have a, dis, a productive outcome from that. So what can we as midwives do now? And I just really want to quickly touch on this about the freedom of information question that was asked by the Royal College of Midwives um, to 24 trusts in London. And the information was broken. Basically, the information was broken down by ethnicity. And what they wanted to find out was the demographics of those midwives who were found themselves in um, under disciplinary sanctions. And as you can see from the information there, um, You've got 32% of the midwives in London are black or black British, yet 60.2% of the midwives subject to disciplinary procedures are black or black British. Some of those midwives um, were dismissed. So, you know, we need to look at these 
the what's going on within the workplaces that there are disproportionate numbers of black and black British midwives um, who are subject to more punitive outcomes from disciplinary proceedings. And you know, why? Why is that happening? And I've just got some slides here with the numbers. I can't really stop and show you that because I'll run out of time. Um, but you can definitely see the numbers here. I think Sue will be sharing these with um, those who have attended. Um, so just some more background information here. Um, we know that the NHS is the most ethnic, eth ethnic, I can't say it, ethnically diverse workforce um, in the UK. Um, and what we do know is that there are concerns around race inequalities that have impacted negatively on nursing and midwifery staff. The other thing we do know is that matters about diversity receives very little attention. So what we really need is um, leadership that is going to actually explore this, um, this situation of where you've got a large number of your, of your staff who are undervalued and least rewarded uh, within the NHS workforce. The other thing just to say um, is that um, there is evidence to suggest that when, when you do the staff surveys that BME staff, when they fill out the forms for the staff surveys and um, they say that they are not happy, they feel like there's discrimination, it is a good predictor um, for evaluation of patient, safe, uh, patient safety, patient care. So it is linked to patient safety. So it can be used as a barometer. The other thing just to say as well, which I find quite concerning is that the data relating to ethnicity around maternal mortality was not collected until 1994. However, within professional circles, academic circles, it was known that black women were overrepresented. Black women are still overrepresented, even though the figures are better. And this uh, mortality rate for black women and Asian women and, and women from minority ethnic backgrounds is unsettling. So how can we change this? What do you think? Um, I'm, when I brought the information about midwives and um, the disproportionate numbers of midwives who find themselves in disciplinary hearings um, and how the, the barometer um, can be used of, of how midwives are feeling within the workplace, um, that can be linked to patient safety. Do you think there's a causal link with the poor outcomes for black, Asian and minority ethnic um, eth women from those backgrounds? The other thing we need to remember is the code of practice. You know, we all are meant to be working um, with this in mind. And so let us all be mindful about our behaviours in the workplace and just uphold the reputation of your profession at all time, at all times. Treat people in the way that does not take advantage of their vulnerability or cause them upset or distress. And I think that's very important. And I just really want to say, he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetuate it. He who accepts evil without protesting against it um, is really cooperating with it. So we all, this, this is everybody's business right now. Um, I know that the RCOG and the RCM, they're working together and they want to reduce um, the numbers of maternal mortality rates for black and minority ethnic women, um, black, Asian and minority ethnic women by 50%. Um, it is everybody's business. And I think we all need to get involved and just look at what we're doing in our practice that can change our policies. Are they fit for purpose with regards to the women that we're looking after? Any questions? Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.